The topic of migration has become more prominent, both in terms of media coverage, but also in terms of political discourse in the last five to ten years. And we see that both in Europe and in the US. And we see the huge political impact it has when uh, there's a lot of concern about what migration does to societies, to our economies. When we look at Europe, it's still dealing with the aftermath and the post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms that emerged from the 2015-2016 uh, migration crisis when about two million asylum seekers and migrants arrived in those two years. And at the same time, the US and North of America is dealing with the developments that have happened in Latin America over the last years with the large migration flow towards Mexico, many of those who are attempting to enter the US. And so both continents are trying to deal with these pushes on the border and different kind of refugee flows that are resulting from different crises across the globe and are really affecting the migration thinking and policy making in those two continents. When we're thinking about how policy and laws are made on migration in Europe, it's important to consider that the European Union has the power to step forward and propose new laws, new policies on migration but that's not directly implementable in the member states. So they can come forward and say, for example, we're going to uh, establish sanctions for employers who recruit and employ illegally staying third country nationals, but that only becomes applicable after maybe sometimes one year or two years when it's been translated into national law. Um, and the EU can only come forward with migration policies that are to be implemented in member states if they can make a strong case for the fact that it's needed and that a single member state is not able to achieve the migration outcome they're aspiring to. So in order to make sure we have a common approach to asylum and that asylum seekers have the same right in each EU member state, it was important for the EU to establish what we have now, the common European asylum system. If we look at the US, we have had a very strong commitment to the international protection regime via the resettlement program. So for many years, and the US have contributed to trying to resolve or deal with humanitarian crisis across the globe by agreeing to resettle refugees and asylum seekers in those countries to the US. It has had one of the highest quota of resettlement across the globe, going up to 70,000, sometimes 100,000 uh, over the years. So if we look at, at why people move, one big factor is conflict. So this is a one that has been really at the heart of a lot of media reports. Uh, we have, of course, the Syria crisis that has been going on for years and that has resulted eventually in the large flows to Europe. We have also more kind of economic uh, situations that push persons to move and to seek for a better way to sustain livelihood opportunities for themselves, for their children, for their larger families. And a clear example there could be what's happened in Venezuela, where people really have moved on, but also uh, what we see in different African countries where there are problems either due to a drought or other kind of broader factors. So, that brings us to the third factor that we will see very much coming up in, in the future, which is, of course, climate change and any relations there to mobility. What we see in the first instance is that due to climate changes that persons may travel within their country, they may go to different regions where there are different types of jobs there, but at some point when those kind of temporary solutions don't work, they try and consider options to move abroad. So this all shows that migration is a very important topic in terms of a transatlantic but also a global conversation and that if we really want to uh, anticipate, not only anticipate but rightly respond to migration movements, we have to do this more at a global level to really understand 
what are some of the factors that are motivating people to speak, why are they choosing the travel routes that they are choosing, and how can we respond in a way that on the one hand mitigates the pressure, but also makes sure that those who are fleeing uh, dire situations can find a way to integrate in the countries close to the conflict hearth or, or other difficult places, but also that there may be, for example, resettlement opportunities for people to move in a safe and legal manner to other areas of the globe. So it's really important to understand what migration does with a community. What does it mean to receive people who come from another culture, or speak a different language, or who just change the face of our communities in a very visual way? What does it mean for people to deal with it? So it's very important that policymakers, that analysts, that governments, that political parties try and get a sense of what it means. In terms of what will drive migratory movements in the next decades, of course we have conflicts, so we're closely monitoring what's happening in different parts of the world because that can actually mobilize a lot of people to move and move very quickly and this often results in very sudden shocks to the migration system. Another big element, of course, is, is climate change. As you may know, the EU has set aside different kind of funds to also deal with those implications. And for example, European Investment Bank is developing a migration strategy, how to better work with countries of origin, also in relation to climate change. And then, of course, there's a third factor, which is very important, and that relates to the livelihood opportunities. Can men, women and children find a way to work, to take care of their families and to educate their young and to make sure that they actually have a future in the place that they live. When we think of what may happen if there's a new surge in migration, whether it's due to a conflict or whether it's due to, for example, an economic downturn that results from the pandemic, we have to think about the operational elements and we need to also think about community dimensions but also the political implications. So we have a lot of know-how, we have some money set aside when another migration crisis may happen, but we don't have the infrastructure to really deal with a sudden inflow. And so then it comes to the fact, if we don't have a migration management system that operates swiftly and functions well, then we have to really start looking at what this means for a community and what this means for the political context of that country. We see that in the absence of a really well-functioning and well-thought-through migration management system is that these kind of situations where we suddenly see a lot of people arriving, where there's a lot of chaos, where there's people working on the streets, where we see people living on the streets, that this actually resonates quite well with those political parties or political leaders who engage in fear-mongering about the dangers that migration will bring to a society. If we think about how can different actors across the Atlantic work together, then a first element would be to get a better sense of where would be the migration pressures in the next period. So where would we see different migration movements happening? So there's a lot of uh, developments and investments in technology to better forecast migration movements, to set up early warning systems. So we could imagine different parties across the Atlantic actually putting their notes and their insights together and really developing that together. Secondly, if we work from the knowledge that one state or one continent ignoring uh, a particular migration pressure building up or trying to prevent those people from accessing the territory, that this then results in a push to another state or to another continent, it's really important that we try to establish a transatlantic discussion on what to do. The key message is that migration is an issue that needs to be really at the heart of the policies and the, the programme of action of the new president. There's already a number of crises in the world that are causing people to move. And with climate change, there are expectations that these kind of conflicts for resources, for water, for access to fertile lands, all those kind of things will only grow and eventually will possibly lead to conflict. So, 
Having a joint understanding of how to deal with these crises will be so important not only for the US but also for different governments across the globe so that's a really important one. And secondly, it's going to be really important to work together on this. We've seen now too often that if we think we can go at it alone, if we try to prevent people from reaching us, this will has an effect on our neighbour and it sours our relationships with our neighbour. With some countries, we're maybe able to allow that relationship to be sour, but in many cases we can't. And in the long term, we need to have a very productive and friendly relationship with our neighbours. We need to make sure that whatever migration policies, whatever protection policies we put on the table, it's in the interest of all countries involved. It needs to make sure that there are opportunities for development on both sides of the table. So whether it comes to economic opportunities and making sure that if we take people on for jobs that they can send repetitions back, that they can invest in development of their country of origin, that's such a really important one. And then more broadly, what we've seen with the COVID pandemic is that labour migrants are not only playing an important role now, like we've seen this uh, in both in Europe, but also in the US, we've seen that uh, labour migrants have been so important in making sure that there's sufficient staff in hospitals and in other healthcare facilities. But it's also important in terms of what we will see is an economic downturn. The labour migrants can help to rebuild a particular sector. So it's really going to be important that we are quickly able to access the skills that we need and smart migration pathways will be so important in this respect. Are we going to allow an economic sector to actually disappear or not be able to compete anymore across the globe? Or are we willing to actually bring labour migrants to our territory? The question of course how is that government, how is that political leader, how is that political party going to present those people as actually an attribute, as something positive, as something contributing to our society? And I think in that sense, a lot of leaders are for the moment shooting in their own foot by presenting migrants as something very negative, as something to fear, as something that's eating away at our resources rather than adding something to it. And it's that kind of short-term approach that will undermine our ability in the longer term in, in having an economic situation that's viable, that's durable, and that's able to provide for all.